ladies and gentlemen. The story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. California. I work here. I'm a cop. It was Monday, August 3rd. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of burglary detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Bernard. My name's Friday. A rash of burglaries had broken out in the city. Homes had been broken into and stripped of their furnishings. There was no lead on the criminals. From each man the detail. It's gonna be our job to buy the gift. Yeah. When's Angus gonna get married? Next Sunday. We haven't got too much time. I don't know why we always have to pick out the gifts. Well, somebody has to do it. You got any ideas what we ought to get him? Well, I talked to Faye over the weekend. She thinks it might be nice if we got him something to start housekeeping with. Maybe some nice kitchenware or table lamp. I don't know if we'd have enough dough for a good lamp. Oh, they might like a bedspread. You can always use them. Maybe a nice wool blanket. Oh, I don't know, Joe. You gotta be careful about those personal things. Well, what do you mean? What's personal about a blanket? Well, we don't know much about the girl Angus is gonna marry. She might not need it. Excuse me, could you tell me something? What's that? I said, could you tell me something? Well, what would you like to know, little girl? Is this where you come to report about stolen things? Well, now that depends. You wanna come in and tell us about it? Thank you, I will. You wanna sit down, little girl? I'm 10 years old. I'll stand if it's all right. Sure. Now, do you want to tell us what's been stolen? Everything. Huh? Everything's been stolen. We came back this morning and found it that way. Grandpa's awful mad. Mm -hmm. Here, what's your name? Ruth Ann Marie Jeanette. Jeanette? Is that your last name? No, Snyder. Ruth Ann Marie Jeanette Snyder. Would well, you come down here alone, Ruth? Yes, Grandpa sent me. He's awful mad. Where do you live? With Grandpa. Where's that? Over in College Avenue. Grandpa's leg's bothering him, so he told me to come down and tell you about it. About what, miss? Everything. We came back this morning on the train, and when we got home, we found everything was stolen. It's terrible. What do you mean by everything? Well, Grandpa and I got back to Los Angeles on the train this morning. We've been on a trip back to Indiana. Uh-huh. We took a taxi cab home from the station. When we got there, everything was gone. Everything but the rug in the living room. What? All the furniture. Every single bit. The sofa, the chairs, my desk upstairs, the stove. Everything's been stolen. We want you to find it. You mean someone broke in while you were gone, took all your furniture? Is that what you think? We know they did. The window in the kitchen, it was broken. They took everything but the living room rug. That's why Grandpa's home now. Huh? He thinks the crooks will be back. He's sitting on the rug because he says if they take that, they'll have to take him, too. Nine forty-five a.m. Frank and I drove Ruth Ann Snyder back to her home on College Avenue. It was an old-fashioned wooden frame structure a few doors up from College Avenue and Everett Way. Ruth Ann showed us inside and introduced us to her grandfather, Mr. John H. Snyder, age seventy-eight. He told us that a year ago he and his wife, Ruth Ann's grandmother, had come to California from Indiana and rented the house on College Avenue. The grandmother had fallen ill and passed away suddenly three weeks ago. He and Ruth Ann closed the house and took the body back to Indiana on the train for burial. On their return that morning, they found the house stripped of every piece of furniture. We checked room by room, listed the missing articles, and then we put in a call for a man from Leighton Fingerprints. Yeah, Do you happen to know the serial numbers of your home appliances, Mr. Snyder? No, sir. I've lived with most of the furniture for 40 years. You know, you get to know the things you own in 40 years. I know what was in my room, Sergeant. My desk. My table and chair, the bed, the curtains, they took everything. How about the estimated value of the furniture, sir? What would you say it was worth? Dollars and cents? I don't know. What's a house full of furniture worth to anyone? Guess everybody puts their own value on their things. Yes, sir. Solid walnut dining set that's our wedding present. Hogany front room table, that was solid, too. Cost money in their day. All gone. Are there any liens on the furniture, sir? How's that? I mean, did you owe anything on the furniture? Any trouble with the finance company or anything like that? Uh, 
He didn't even know what a finance company was when the wife and I was married. Sad enough trip as it was. And Ruth and me get here this morning and everything's gone. All we own. Uh, Ruthie? Yes, Grandpa? Where the thieves broke in, would you show the officers? It's over here, officer. How are you and your grandfather going to get along, Ruthie? Grandpa says we'll buy two cots for tonight. Army surplus. No stove to cook on. We'll have to eat out. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll have to go back to Indiana. Grandpa doesn't have much money. He's on a pension. Here's the door. You can see what they did to get in. Windows broken. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You'll find the crooks, won't you, Sergeant? Well, we're going to try, Ruthie. We better have the crime lab check this. Yeah. How about the neighbors? You know them well? I know who they are. I don't know any of them good. They're not very friendly. Mm -hmm. Well, we'd like to ask you and your grandpa some more questions, Ruthie. All right. I don't know what I'm going to do when school starts. They stole all my stuff, even my composition tablets. They didn't have to take those. What grade are you in? I was in the A5. I will be in the B6. Why would they take my school things? I don't know. You see how they got in back there? Yes, sir, we did. By any chance, did any of your neighbors know that you and Ruth here were going away? Well, I didn't mention it, no. Then no one kept an eye on your house while you were gone. Oh, I didn't figure it was necessary. Might have helped. I just remembered, Grandpa. Mrs. Merton. I told her we were going away. Who's that, Ruth? She runs the store down at the corner, the bird store. What? She sells canaries, other kind of birds, too. Mrs. Merton's her name. Store's right down the corner. And you figure she's the only one who knew you'd be gone from the house for some time? Must have been the only one. All right, Mr. Snyder, we'll be back to see you later on. Here's our card. We'll see if we can't do something to help you out. Smith, Friday, burglar detail. All right, thank you, boy. Ruth will show you to the door. Yes, Grandpa. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye. Who oh, say there? Yes, sir. I guess you understand. I'd like to apologize anyway. Uh, I just couldn't do it. What's that, sir? Offer you a chair. Ten thirty a.m. Frank and I called the Salvation Army and told them of Snyder's situation. Then we went down the street to the store at the corner of College Avenue and Everett Way. The sign on the window said Mrs. Merton's Birdland. Manager, Agnes Merton. We tried the door. It was locked. A penciled note taped on the glass read, be back at 1 p.m. We went back up College Avenue and started ringing doorbells. Some of the residents in the block didn't even know the Snyders. Of those that did, only two had noticed any activity at the house during the three weeks Mr. Snyder and his granddaughter had been away. They told us that they'd seen a moving van parked in front of the house about a week before. They also saw men moving furniture from the house into the van. Neither of the two could describe the vehicle or remember its license number. 12.45 p.m. We had a cup of coffee and a hamburger, and then we headed back for Mrs. Merton's bird shop. Now, you be quiet, Blackie. Always making so much noise. No, no, no. Don't you sass me. You just eat your food and be quiet. Can I help you, gentlemen? Yes, ma'am. We're police officers. We'd like to ask you a few questions. Mm -hmm. Something about the birds? No, ma'am. About one of your neighbors. Oh? The Snyders. They live just up the street from you. Oh, yes. The old couple. Poor Mrs. Snyder passed away, you know, a few weeks ago. Yes, ma'am. We know. Now, you be quiet, Mary. You heard what I told Blackie. Just eat your food and be quiet. I guess you knew the Snyders have been away for the last few weeks. Yes, I did. But they're back. I saw Ruthie pass the window this morning. Have you noticed any activity around the Snyder's house since they've been gone? Why, yes, I did. Just what did you notice, Mrs. Merton? Well, it was seven or eight days ago, I think. Some moving truck stopped in front of their place, and two men started moving out the Snyder's furniture. Uh-huh. I thought it was a little strange, because Ruthie hadn't told me anything about moving. In fact, she said definitely she and her grandpa were coming back after poor Mrs. Snyder's funeral in Indiana. Well, did you investigate it all, ma'am? Uh... Excuse me. Now, who was that? You, Fred. Yes, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. You can see I'm busy. Now, another outburst like that out of you and all four of you. Fred, Blackie, Ed and Mary Coleman, I'll take care of you. You little rascals. Where was I now? You saw the moving van in front of the Snyders. Oh, yes. And I went up to the moving men and asked them if the Snyders were going back to Indiana. Well, of course, they didn't know anything about it. Well, did you inquire at the Snyders' house, ma'am? Well, no. It so happens I didn't. 
I was on my way to one of the big aviaries in the valley, and I just didn't have time to stop. How about the moving van? Did you happen to notice the license? I don't remember the numbers. Any identifying marks about the truck that you might remember? Maybe a sign on the side? Yes. The side of the truck was painted white, and there was large blue lettering on it. Plan and storage, it said. I remember that much. Is that all? Well, yes. As I said, I was in a hurry. I had to pick up three very sick canaries out in the valley. Is there anything else you can remember? Anything at all? No, I'm afraid not. Well, thank you very much, Miss Merton. Here's our card if you happen to come across any further information. Yes, all right. I'll have to go see this night. Perhaps I can help. Well, thank you very much, ma'am. Goodbye. Yes, goodbye. goodbye. Now, Fred, you be quiet this minute. You hear me? You too, Blackie. Not much help in there. Not much. Gave me an idea, though. Yeah, what's that? The wedding present for the Anguses. Huh? Maybe two lovebirds in a nice cage. You suppose she'd sell Fred and Blackie? <laughs> 5 p.m. Reports had come in from two more burglary victims. That night, Frank and I drove out and interviewed them. The circumstances of the theft and the M.O. of the criminals matched identically with the Snyder case. Both of the families victimized had gone off on vacations and neglected to notify either the neighbors or the patrolmen in their area. Both had allowed newspapers to collect on their doorsteps in their absence and otherwise left signs that their homes were vacant. In both cases, the thieves had forced an entrance through a back door or a window, stripped the house of every last piece of furniture, and either hauled it away themselves or hired someone to do it for them. Again, the neighbors saw the moving vans, but none of them were able to definitely identify the vehicles or their license numbers. 8.45 p.m. Before we went home, Frank and I checked back in at the office. One of the others assigned to the case, Jim Angus, wasn't having any more luck than we were. I guess we're gonna have to try harder, that's all. Done about everything we can so far. We started to check of the movers around town, the transfer companies. Leighton Prince come up with anything yet? No, no luck. Hope we get this thing washed up before my wedding. Just hate to get called back to my honeymoon. Yeah. It's one of the lousiest rackets we've had since I came on this detail. Whole house fulls of furniture, everything a family owns. How about an outlet for all the stuff that's been stolen? The thieves can't be sitting on it. Pawn shop and second-hand details have been alerted. They're checking regular outlets, auction houses, second-hand places. Nothing yet. Well, what about some kind of preventive idea? At least slow them down. Well, a good dose of publicity on the thing might help. If only people wouldn't keep it a secret when they're going away. The neighbors aren't alerted. That's why a lot of them didn't think much of it when they saw the moving vans parked at those houses. The drawn blinds and the papers on the doorsteps didn't help much either. It's an open invitation. Maybe we ought to see what we can do on the publicity end. We've had one campaign on this already. Burglary, Angus. Yeah? Uh-huh. Well, what's the address? Okay, I got it. Thanks. Another one. Huh? 63 artists called it in. Family back from vacation, furniture all gone. Here's the address. Thanks. Guess we better get on it right away, huh? Yeah. Well, maybe we can get more help on this tomorrow. Reynolds and Medina will be free. Maybe the captain can spare them. Yeah, good idea. Check you later, huh, Jim? Right, see ya. Sergeant Friday, you remember me, don't you? Mrs. Merton? Oh, sure, the bird store. How are you? Oh, I guess everything will be all right now. How's that? I saw it today on Olive Street. What's that? The moving truck that came to the Snyders. That's the license number. August 11th, 10 p.m. The license number which Mrs. Merton had given us was checked through DMV. We found that the truck was registered in the name of a local second-hand furniture dealer by the name of Ben Wynant. We checked his name with the police commission and then with the Eye Bureau. He had a good reputation, no criminal record. Early the next morning, we picked up Mr. Snyder and his granddaughter, Ruth, and we drove to Ben's used furniture store. We identified ourselves and asked to look at his buy book. Under the date of July 27th, Ben Wynett had recorded the purchase of more than three dozen articles of furniture from a house on College Avenue. The address was that of the Snyders. A man and a woman, Sergeant. They said the company he worked for had transferred him to Boston. Told me he had to get back to take over his new job. Would you recognize the people if you saw them again, Mr. Wynett? Sure, I think so. The woman was a great talker. She said they figured on selling the stuff piece by piece. They'd get more. But since they had to leave town the next day, she decided to sell the whole lot to a dealer. You got the furniture for a pretty low price, didn't you? Pretty good price, yeah. That's why I went along on the fast deal. I wasn't going to talk myself out of a bargain. They wanted to sell fast, I wanted to buy. I didn't think anything was wrong. Sergeant. Yes, sir. A Walden's dining room set, right there. 
You sure, Mr. Snyder? Cigar burn on top. Oh. I'd know it anywhere. I see. And uh, this looks like mine, too. Sergeant, my table and my desk. Here they are, right here. My school stuff, too. Well, they sure stuck me all right. The last fast deal I'll ever make. How'd they contact you, Mr. Winant? What kind of approach they use? Called me on the phone. I came out and gave him an appraisal on the stuff. Nothing suspicious about either the man or the woman. That's so? She was in a house dress, bandana around her head. The guy was in old clothes, just as homey as you please. It looked like he was doing a little repair work around the house, you know. Did you notice if they had a car parked by the house? No, as a matter of fact, I didn't. There wasn't any in the driveway. Uh -huh. uh, the woman said they had other business to wind up. So if they weren't at the house when I came back with the van, why, she'd leave the back door open for me. I guess you realize we'll have to place a hold on this furniture that you bought. Yeah, I know. Got nobody to blame but myself. You gave this man and woman a check for the full amount of the sale, is that right? $550 down the drain. Do you have the cancel check? No, not yet. If you like, you can probably get it from the bank. Don't imagine those crooks would waste any time cashing it. We'd appreciate it if you'd run down to the bank with us now. Okay, Sergeant. I'll have to get somebody to mind the store. I'll meet you down there. Fine. Sergeant, I wonder if I could speak to Mr. Wynant. Sure, go right ahead. Mr. Wynant? Yes, sir? I'm sorry about all this. I didn't know. Mr. Wynant, you buy furniture, don't you? Yes, sir. What do you give me for two army surplus cots? Wynant made arrangements to round up Mr. Snyder's furniture and ship it back to his home. down at his bank where he recovered the canceled check for $550. The endorsement read, Mr. Thomas Butterworth. According to the bank teller who waited on them, the suspects had cashed the check shortly after the sale of the Snyder's furniture. From the second-hand dealer and the clerk at the bank, we got a complete description of the man and woman known as Mr. and Mrs. Butterworth. We also had photostatic copies made of the check and specimens of the handwriting from the endorsement. From their descriptions, we checked the suspects through the stats office. We got nowhere. During the next two weeks, we found six more second-hand dealers who had been taken in on the same furniture deal. The description of the man and the woman matched, and so did the handwriting in the endorsements on each check. There was only one variation. The couple went under a different name on each occasion. Wednesday, August 26th, 9 a.m. Twelve cases like this to date. Is that what you got? That's it. Got their description, M.O., handwriting. Still can't reach them. Those thieves have been freewheeling for a month now. What's it going to take to stop them? Well, I had an idea coming to work this morning. I'd like to hear what you think about it. What's that? Kind of a system of decoys. Thinking it might be a good idea to contact all the division captains, have them ask their men if they have any neighbors going on vacation. Uh-huh. Go ahead. Well, if we could get a few dozen houses spotted around the city, we could plant a few things, make them look vacant. We'd keep the houses covered at all times. They ought to make pretty good bait for the thieves. Yeah. Sounds okay. How would you set it up? We could make arrangements to get a key to each home, keep the milk and paper deliveries coming, let them pile up on the doorstep. We could reimburse the people for whatever it cost. Well, we're not making much speed the way we're going. We could try this for a couple of weeks and see what happens. What do you think? Let's try it. 9.30 a.m. After checking with Captain Bernard, we contacted all division commanders, requesting them to ask their men to contact burglary detail if they knew of any of their neighbors about to leave on a vacation. During the next two days, the response came in and the plan went into effect. Forty homes throughout the city were spotted as decoys. They were kept under surveillance at all times. In the week that followed, two more burglaries of the same type were reported, but the suspects failed to try any of the decoy homes. Again, the homes that had been broken into displayed all the usual signs that the occupants were away. Old circulars and newspapers scattered on the lawn, milk bottles lined up at the door, all the blinds drawn. The decoy plan continued, no result. August 31st, we had a report of another burglary involving the theft of furniture. We made our investigation. 2 p.m., we went back to the office to get out the list of stolen articles. Hi, Frank. Joe. Hi, Angus. When'd you get back from your honeymoon? Late last night. Say, Thelma and I sure like to thank all you fellas for that wedding present you sent us. Darn nice of you. Well, we're glad you like it, Angus. Sure of you. I'd like to ask you a question about it, though. Hope you won't take it wrong. No, go ahead. Well, what is it? You have an early American house, don't you? 
Yeah, that's right. Well, it's an antique. Yeah, I know that. It's an automatic apple peeler. One of the first ever built. Oh. Sure. Thanks a lot. I'll get it. Burglary Friday. Yeah, where? Yeah, I got it. Right away. Thanks. One of the decoy houses. Yeah. We got a bite. Together with Sergeants Carson and Angus, we drove out to the decoy house where an unidentified man and woman had been seen forcing entry through a back door. They had been spotted by a police officer's wife who lived next door and who had called in the report. We parked down the street from the decoy home and we waited. Five minutes passed. We saw a woman come out to the porch of the house, look up and down the street, and then go back inside. A few minutes after that, a man in a tan Ford pulled up in front of the house. He got out and entered through the front door. I call communications for a make on the car. 1K80 to control one. 1K80 to control one. 1K80, go ahead. Request DMV on 1 Union 55887. That's 1 Union 55887. Information urgent. 1K80, Roger. We waited. There were no signs of activity from the decoy house. Two minutes after I put in the call, we got our make on the car. 1K80. 1K80. 1K80, go ahead. 1 Union 558. Seven, a 1950 model Ford two-door sedan. Engine number B31G148453, registered to Kenneth Dunbar, legal the same. 1K80, Roger. A few minutes after the call back, a moving van drove down the street and backed up in front of the decoy house. Two men got out, went up to the front door, and they were let in. Okay, Joe? Yeah. Carson, you and Angus want to cover the back? Right. Yeah, you want something? Police officers. Can the cops arrest him? Hey, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. No. Let go of me. Let me go. All right, lady, relax, will you? Oh, look at him, a big stoop. I told him it couldn't last forever. I told him a week ago, let's get out. No, he had to try once more, the big dumb stoop. All right, lady, let's we'll go. We'll take him, Angus. Get him. You better get that shirt fixed. Huh? Come on, lady. Yeah. Look at that, Joe. Lipstick all over me. Uh-huh. Doesn't look very good, does it? No, it doesn't. What are you going to tell your new bride? <laughs> I've got nothing to hide. I'll tell her the truth. Uh-huh. Why not? She'll believe me. Won't she, Joe? November 25th, trial was held in Department 87, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The suspects were tried and convicted of burglary in the second degree, 15 counts. Burglary in the second degree is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of not less than one, nor more than 15 years.